Hello there. Welcome to Network Design. You are a sought-after spaceship designer. You have been asked to design a new spaceship. Your first questions are, what will this ship be used for? How large is the crew? Will it be a warship or a cargo ship? A science and exploration vessel, maybe. So what if the answer is, the crew can be as few as 50 people? but it must be able to hold as many as 500. It will be used in a variety of ways. So how do you design a ship like this? You must design the size and configuration of the ship and the power it requires wisely. So designing a network to meet current requirements and to adapt to the future requirements is a complex task, but it can be done. So thanks to hierarchical and scalable network designs, that use the right components. You know you want to learn about this. Even if you have not designed your current network, knowing about your network design will increase your value to the organization as a great network administrator or systems administrator. And who doesn't want that? Okay? So for the objectives, so you should be able to explain how data, voice, and video are converged in a switch network. Okay. So the need to scale the network. So our digital world is changing. So the ability to access the internet and the corporate network is no longer confined to physical offices, geographical locations, or time zones. In today's globalized work, Employees can access resources from anywhere in the world, and information must be available at any time, on any device. So these requirements drive the need to build a next-generation networks that are secure, reliable, and highly available. So these next-generation networks must not only support current expectations and equipment, but also it must be able to integrate legacy platforms. So businesses increasingly rely on their network infrastructure to provide mission-critical services. So as businesses grow and evolve, they hire more employees, open more branches, and expand into a global market. So these changes directly affect the requirements of a network, which must be able to scale to meet the needs of the business. So a network must support the exchange of various types of network traffic, including data files, email, IP telephony, and video applications for multiple business units. All enterprise networks must be able to do the following. Okay, So it must support critical applications. It must support converged network traffic. Support diverse business needs and provide centralized administrative control. So the LAN is the networking infrastructure that provides access to network communication services and resources for end users and devices. So the end users and devices may be spread over a single floor or building. You create a campus network by interconnecting group of LANs that are spread over a small geographic area. So campus designs or campus network designs include small networks that use a single LAN switch up to a very large networks with thousands of connections. Okay. Now let's talk about the borderless switched networks. So with increasing demands of the converged network, the network must be developed with an architectural approach that embeds intelligence simplifies operations and is scalable to meet future demands. So one of the more recent developments in network design is the Cisco borderless network. So we already have covered an open standards. Okay. So in here, we will be talking about the proprietary, which can also be useful to any computer engineering or information technology students. So the borderless network is a network architecture that combines innovation and design. So it allows organization to support a borderless network that can connect anyone 
anywhere, anytime, and on any device, securely, reliably, and seamlessly. So this architecture is designed to address IT and business intelligence, or even business challenges, such as supporting the converged network and changing work patterns. So the borderless network provides a framework to unify wired and wireless, okay, including policy, access control, and performance management across many different device types. So using this architecture, the borderless network, as shown in the figure here, okay, is built on hierarchical infrastructure of hardware that is scalable and resilient. So by combining this hardware infrastructure with policy-based software solutions, the borderless network provides two primary sets of services, network services and user and endpoint services under the umbrella of an integrated management solution. So it enables the different network elements to work together and allows users to access resources from any place at any time while providing optimization scalability and security. Now, creating a borderless uh, switch network requires that sound network design principles that are used to ensure maximum availability, flexibility, security, and manageability. So the borderless switch network design guides or guidelines are built upon the following principles. So it must be hierarchical, okay? It must be modular. It must be resilient and flexible, okay? So these four principles, okay? Let's start with hierarchical. Let's define it. Hierarchical, the design facilitates understanding the role of each device at every tier, simplifies deployment, operations, and management, and reduces fault domains at every tier, okay? So modularity, the design allows seamless network expansion and integrated service enablement on an demand basis. Okay. So resiliency, the design satisfies user expectations for keeping the network always on. And flexibility, the design allows intelligent traffic load sharing by using all network resources. So these are not independent principles. So understanding how each principle fits in the context of other is critical. So designing a borderless switch network in a hierarchical fashion creates a foundation that allows network designers to overlay security, mobility, and unified communication features. So two time-tested and proven hierarchical design frameworks for campus networks are the three-year and the two-tier layer design here, okay? So when you say three-tier, you have the presence of the access layer, the distribution layer, and the core layer, okay? So this is a hierarchical design framework for campus networks, okay? So when you say two-tier layer, you combine the core and distribution layer into one, and you have the access layer, okay? So this is good for small networks, and this one here is designed for the enterprise. So the three critical layers within this tier design are the access, distribution, and core layer. So each layer can be seen as well-defined structured module with specific roles and functions in the campus network. So introducing modularity into the campus hierarchical design further ensures that campus network remains resilient and flexible enough to provide critical network services. So modularity also helps to allow for growth and changes that occur over time on your network infrastructure. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the hierarchical networks. So there are three components. As you can see here, you've got the access the distribution and the core layer. So what are this? So let's discuss each layer one by one, okay? So the access layer represents the network edge where traffic enters or exits the campus network. So traditionally, 
The primary function of an access layer switch is to provide network access to the user. So access layer switches connect to distribution layer switches, which implement network foundation technologies such as routing, quality of service, and security. So to meet network application and end user demand, the next generation switching platforms now provide more converged, integrated, and intelligent services to various types of endpoints at the network edge. So building an intelligence into access layer switches allows application to operate on the network more efficiently and securely. So access layer is where the users are situated. So basically in an office or laboratory or workstations where the users are. So that is the access layer. Okay. So the next one is distribution layer. So the distribution layer interfaces between the access layer and the core layer to provide many important functions, including aggregating large scale wiring closet networks, aggregating layer two broadcast domains and layer three routing boundaries, providing intelligent switching routing and network access policy functions to access the rest of the network. So providing high availability through redundant distribution layer switches to the end user and equal cost path to the core. So providing differentiated services to various classes of service applications at the edge of the network. Okay, so the last one is the core layer. So the core layer is the network backbone. Okay, it connects several layers of the campus network. So the core layer serves as the aggregator for all the other campus blocks and ties the campus together with the rest of the network. So the primary purpose of the core layer is to provide fault isolation and high-speed backbone connectivity. So if these three layers are present in your design, then you have a three-tiered layer design. If you only have two layers because you combine distribution and core layer because it is just a small business, then you have a two-tiered design with the combinations of distribution layer and core and the access layer. Now, a three-tier campus network design for organizations where the access, distribution, and core are its separated layers. So to build a simplified, scalable, cost-effective, and efficient physical cable layout design, the recommendation is to build an extended star physical network topology from a centralized building location to all other buildings on the same campus. Okay, so again, when you say a three-tier campus network design, you have to adopt the three layers, core, distribution, and access. All right? Now, in some cases, because of lack of physical or network scalability restrictions, maintaining a separate distribution and core layer is not required. So in smaller campus locations where there are fewer users accessing the network or in a campus site consisting of a single building, separate core and distribution layers may not be needed. So in this scenario, the recommendation is the alternate two-tier campus network design, or also known as the collapsed core network design. Okay? And this is a two-tier campus network. All right. So next would be the role of a switch network. So the role of a switch network has evolved dramatically in the last two decades. So it was not long ago that a flat layer two switch networks were the norm. So flat layer two switch networks relied on the ethernet and the widespread use of switch network, okay? And the hub, okay? So during that time, hub is being utilized, okay? So hub is used to propagate LAN traffic throughout the organization. So as shown in the figure, networks have fundamentally changed to switch LANs in a hierarchical network. All right? So a switch LAN allows additional flexibility, traffic management, quality of service, and security. It also affords support for wireless networking and connectivity and support for other technologies such as IP telephony, and mobility services. 
Okay. Now, you understand that your network is going to change. Its numbers of users will likely increase. They may be found anywhere and they will be using a wide variety of devices. So your network must be able to change along with its users. So scalability is the term for the network that can grow without losing availability. So for the objectives of this subsection, you should be able to explain considerations for designing a scalable network. So to support a large, medium, or small network, the network designer must develop a strategy to enable the network to be available and to scale effectively and easily. So included in a basic network design strategy are the following recommendations. So use expandable modular equipment or cluster devices that can be easily upgraded to increase capabilities. So device modules can be added to existing equipment to support new features and devices without requiring major requirement upgrades. So some devices can be integrated in a cluster to act as one device to simplify management and configuration. So design a hierarchical network to include modules that can be added, upgraded, and modified as necessary. So without affecting the design of the other functional areas of the network. For example, so creating a separate access layer that can be expanded without affecting the distribution and core layers of the campus network. So create an IPv4 and IPv6 address strategy that is hierarchical. Careful address planning eliminates the need to readdress the network to support additional users and services and choose routers or multi-layer switches to limit broadcasts and filter other undesirable traffic from the network. So use layer 3 devices to filter and reduce traffic on the network core. Okay? Okay, so let's move on to the design for scalability. So as what I'm saying earlier, scalability is the term for a network that can grow without losing availability and reliability. So this can be accomplished using redundancy, multiple links, scalable routing protocols, and wireless connectivity. Okay, so let's start the scalable networks with planning for redundancy. For many organizations, the availability of network is essential to supporting business needs. Redundancy is an important part of network design. It can prevent disruption of network services by minimizing the possibility of a single point of failure. So one method of implementing redundancy is by installing duplicate equipment and providing failover services for critical devices. Another method of implementing redundancy is redundant path, as shown in the diagram here. Okay, so you've got redundant paths connecting from one section to another section. Okay, so redundant paths in a switch network supports high availability. However, due to the operation of switches, a redundant path in a switch Ethernet network may cause logical layer 2 loops. For this reason, the spanning tree protocol or STP is required. So STP eliminates layer 2 loops when redundant links are used between switches. So it does this by providing a mechanism for disabling redundant paths in a switch network until the path is necessary, such as when the failure occurs. STP is an open standard protocol used in a switch environment to create a loop-free logical topology. So using a layer 3 in the backbone is another way to implement redundancy. Without the need of STP, at layer 2, layer 3 also provides the best path selection and faster convergence during failover. Okay, so the next one is reduce failure domain size. So a well-designed network does not control traffic but also limits the size of failure domains. A failure domain is the area of the network that is impacted when a critical device on a network services or experiences problems. 
So the function of the device that initially fails determines the impact of failure dementia. For example, a malfunctioning switch on the network segment normally affects only the hosts okay, connected to that switch, or that is part of that segment. However, if the router that connects this segment to others fails, the impact is much greater. So the use of redundant links and reliable enterprise class equipment minimizes the chance of disruption in the network. So smaller failure domains reduces the impact of failure on company productivity. So they also simplify the troubleshooting process, thereby shortening the downtime for all the users. So failure domains often include other smaller failure domains. Okay. So this is how you design your failure domain. So limiting the size of failure domains. So because a failure at the core layer of a network can have potentially large impact, the network designer often concentrates on efforts to prevent failures. So these efforts can greatly increase the cost of implementing the network. So in the hierarchical design, okay, it is easiest and usually least expensive to control the size of failure domain in the distribution layer. So in the distribution layer, network errors can be contained in a smaller area, thus affecting fewer users. So when using a layer three devices at a smaller um, network, okay, specifically on the distribution layer, every router functions as a gateway for a limited number of access layer users. Okay, so in here, okay, so the network designer, okay, so uses the failure domain size, okay, reducing it, so per router connection, okay. So all devices and the routers, if this router goes down, this will make sure, okay, or this will definitely be disconnected on the network, okay. So this is one failure domain, okay. So that is if the router goes down. Now the designer might be able to reduce the failure domain size further into a layer of a switch or an access point in this case. So an access point here, if this AP1 goes down, then only the wireless clients, specifically H1, will be affected. It will not affect the rest of the network. So this is the failure domain for AP1. Okay. So other design might include if switch one goes down, then these devices, AP1, H2, H3, and H1 here is the only affected workstations or components. So this is a switch one failure domain. So we call it a switch block deployment. So routers or multi-layer switches are usually deployed in pairs. So with access layer switches, evenly divided between them. This configuration is referred to as building or departmental switch block. Okay? So each switch block acts independently of the others. As a result, the failure of a single device does not cause the network to go down. So even the failure of the entire switch block does not affect a significant number of end users. Okay? Now on the second figure here, this is another uh, failure domain, limiting only to those devices that connected to switch two. So if, if switch two goes down, it will not affect the switch one network. Okay. You could also dig into a failure domain for switch three. Okay. So that means if switch three goes down, only host six and host five are affected and thus H4 is not affected. Okay. So this is reducing the folder domain size, okay, in network design. Okay, so another is increased bandwidth. We call it link aggregation or Ether channel. So in hierarchical network design, some links between access and distribution switches may need to process a greater amount of traffic than other links. So as traffic from multiple links converges into a single outgoing link, it is possible for that link to become a bottleneck. So link aggregation, such as Ether channel, allows the administrator 
to increase the amount of bandwidth between devices by creating one logical link that made up of several physical links. So from this diagram here, we have two physical links and we bundled it into one. So the capability of one physical link okay, will be combined with the other. Okay, so getting what we want okay, in terms of capacity. Okay, so we are going to combine the physical links to get one logical link that will act as one. So Ether Channel uses an existing switch port. Therefore, additional costs to upgrade the link to a faster and more expensive connection are not necessary. So the Ether Channel is seen as one logical link using an Ether Channel interface. So most configuration tasks are done on the Ether Channel interface. So instead of each individual port ensuring configuration consistency throughout the links. So finally, the Ether Channel configuration takes advantage of load balancing between links that are part of the same Ether Channel. And depending on the hardware platform, one or more load balancing methods can be implemented. Okay, so if you want to speed up the performance of your connection, then one option is Ether Channel. This will definitely increase the bandwidth. Okay. All right. So next is expand the access layer. So the network must be designed to be able to expand network access to individuals and devices as needed. An increasingly important option for extending access layer connectivity is through wireless. So providing wireless connectivity offers many advantages such as increased flexibility, reduced costs, and the ability to grow and adapt to changing network and business requirements. So to communicate wirelessly, and devices requires a wireless NIC that incorporates a radio transmitter or receiver and the required software driver to make it operational. So additionally, a wireless router or a wireless access point is required for users to connect as shown in the diagram here. So any wireless access point that would provide wireless access to the clients is necessary. Okay. So there are many considerations when implementing a wireless network, such as the types of wireless devices to use, uh, wireless coverage requirements, interference considerations, and security considerations. All right. Next. We also need to fine tune the routing protocols. Okay. So advanced routing protocols such as the OSPF are used in a large networks. So OSPF, or the Open Shortest Path First, is a link state routing protocol as shown in the figure here. OSPF works well for large networks or large hierarchical networks where fast convergence is important. So OSPF routers okay, establish and maintain neighbor adjacencies with other connected OSPF routers. So OSPF routers synchronize their link state databases. So when a network change occurs, the link state updates are sent, informing other OSPF routers of the change and establishing a new best path if one is available. Okay, so the technique used for fine tuning the routing protocols is maybe you need to divide your network into sub areas. Okay, limiting the size of the network into a single area. But the consideration applies here, wherein all the area or the non-zero area should be connected to area zero or the backbone. All right. All right. So let's talk about the switch hardware now. This is also a requirement in network design. Okay. So one simple way to create a hierarchical and scalable network is to use the right equipment for the job. So there is a variety of switch platforms, form factors, and other features that you should consider before choosing a switch. So the objective of this segment is to explain how switch hardware features support network requirements. So we will be talking about 
the administrator's consideration in choosing the switch. Okay. So when designing a network, it is important to select the proper hardware to meet the current network requirements, as well as to allow for network growth. So within an enterprise network, both switches and routers play a critical role in network communication. All right. So there are five categories of switches for the enterprise networks. So these are campus LAN switches, cloud managed switches, data center switches, service provider switches, and virtual networking switches. Okay. So let's start with the switch platform, Campus LAN switches. So to scale network performance in an enterprise LAN, there are core distribution and access and compact switches. Okay. So this switch platform vary from fanless switches with eight fixed ports to 13 blade switches supporting hundreds of ports. Okay. Okay, so the next one is a cloud managed switches. Okay. So cloud managed switches enable virtual stacking of switches. So they monitor and configure thousands of switch ports over the web without intervention of on-site IT staff. Okay. The next platform is a data center switch. A data center switch should be built based on switches that promote infrastructure scalability, operational continuity, and transport flexibility. So they monitor and configure thousands of switch ports over the web without the intervention of the on-site IT staff. All right, this is how it looked like for data center switches. Next is a service provider switches. So service provider Ethernet access switches feature application intelligence, unified services, virtualization, integrated security, and simplified management. So the service provider switches fall under two categories, aggregation switches and Ethernet access switches. Aggregation switches are carrier-grade Ethernet switches that aggregate traffic at the edge of the network. While service provider Ethernet access switches features application intelligence, unified services, virtualization, integrated security, and simplified management. Okay. So the last one is virtual networking or the virtual network switches. So networks are becoming increasingly virtualized. That is why there is uh, a need for the vendors to develop a virtual networking switches okay okay so the next consideration is a switch form factors so when selecting switches network administrators must determine the switch form factors this includes fixed configuration modular configuration stackable or non-stackable okay so when you say fixed configuration switches Features and options on a fixed configuration switches are limited to those that originally came with a switch. All right, so you just have to use the switch. You will not be able to configure it. Okay, so we call it fixed configuration switches. Now, modular configuration switches, the chassis on a modular switches except field replaceable line cards. Okay. Next. Now, for the fixed configuration switches, features and options on a fixed config configuration switches are limited to those that originally came with a switch. So, a sample or examples of a fixed configuration switches is shown on your screen here. Okay, so this is how it looked like. So, basically, you just have to plug in your computers in there, and then that's it. That's plug and play. All right. For the modular configuration switches. So the chassis on the modular switches are field replaceable line cards. So that means it's just like similar to your computer where in if you want to upgrade the performance of, com of your computer, you just need to change some of the IOS there. So like the graphics card or the video card should be replaced with a new one. So same thing with this, the switches accept field replaceable line cards. Okay. 
Next one would be the stackable configuration switches. So special cables are used to connect stackable switches that allow them to effectively operate as one large switch. So even though they are individually purchased, okay, so we can connect them and operate them as one using a special cable. Okay, so you, you could have multiple switches, stackable switches, and once done with the configurations and connection, you configured and access them as one large switch. Okay. So another switch form factor that you need to consider as network administrator is the thickness of the switch. Okay. So the thickness of the switch, which is expressed in the number of rack units, is also important for switches that are mounted on the rack. Okay. So for example, the configuration switches shown in the figure are all one rack units or one U. Okay. So that is 1.75 inches or 44.45 millimeters in height. Okay, so we call it one U. Okay, so when you have the size of the switch, okay, so the height is twice this one, we call it two U. All right, so having this three is a three U and so on. All right. Okay, so next is port density. Okay, the port density of a switch refers to the number of ports available on a single switch. So the figure shows the port density on three different switches here. Okay, so you could have something like uh, you you have to count the number of ports that pertains to port density. Okay, you've got two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. So this one here is a twenty-four port switch, or the port density is twenty-four. So this one here is double, so it should be a 48 port density. Okay, so fixed configuration switches supports a variety of port density configurations. So these switches are in 12, 24, 48 port configurations as shown in the figure. Okay, so the 48 port switch has an option for additional ports for small form factor pluggable or SFP devices we have on this side. All right. Modular switches can support a very high port densities through the addition of multiple switch port line cards. So the modular switch shown in the diagram here supports up to 384 switch port interfaces. Could you just imagine the number of ports there? Okay, so this one is for the modular. So large network that supports many thousands of network, de uh, network devices requires high density modular switches to make the best use of the space and power. So without using high density modular switch, the network would need to many fixed configuration switches to accommodate the number of devices that need network access. So this approach can consume many power outlets and lots of closet space. Okay, so therefore, as a future network designer, Okay, so you must also consider the issue of uplink bottlenecks. So a series of fixed configuration switches may consume many additional ports for bandwidth aggregation. Okay, so for the purpose of achieving target performance. So with a single modular switch, bandwidth aggregation is less of an issue because the backplane of the chassis can provide the necessary bandwidth to accommodate the devices connected to the switch port line cards. All right. Okay, so another consideration is the forwarding rates. So aside from port density, next is forwarding rates. So forwarding rates defines the processing capabilities of a switch by rating how much data the switch can process per second. So switch product lines are classified by forwarding rates. So entry level switches have lower forwarding rates than enterprise level switches. So forwarding rates are important to consider when selecting a switch. So if the switch forwarding rate is too low, it cannot accommodate a full wire connection or full wire speed connection across all of its switch ports. So wire speed is the data rate that its Ethernet port on the switch is capable of attaining. So data rates of 100, 1 gigabit per second, 10 GB or 100 GB. OK, 
Okay, so for example, a typical 48 port gigabit switch operating at a full wire speed generates 48 Gbps of traffic. So if the switch only supports a forwarding rate of 32 Gbps, it cannot run at a full wire speed across all ports simultaneously. So fortunately, access layer switches typically do not need to operate at full wire speed because they are physically limited by their uplinks to the distribution layer. So this means that less expensive, lower performing switches can be used on the access layer and more expensive, higher performing switches can be used at the distribution layer and core layers. Okay, So where the forwarding rate has a greater impact on uh, network performance. Okay. Next, you might want to consider power over Ethernet. Okay, The power over Ethernet or PoE allows the switch to deliver power to a device over the existing Ethernet cabling. So these features can be used by IP phones and some wireless access points allowing them to be installed anywhere that there is an Ethernet cable. So a network administrator should ensure that the PoE features are actually required for a given installation because switches that support PoE are expensive. Okay, see PoE is a type of feature of a switch where you don't need a power supply to power up your device. So power is also generated and supplied by a switch when you connect your device to it. Okay, next consideration is a multi-layer switching. Okay, multi-layer switches are typically deployed in the core and distribution layers of an organization switch network. So multi-layer switches are characterized by their ability to build a routing table, supporting a new routing protocols and forward IP packets at a rate close to the layer to forwarding. So multi-layer switches often supports specialized hardware, such as the application-specific integrated circuits, or ASICs. So ASICs, along with dedicated software data structures, can streamline the forwarding of IP packets independent of the CPU. So there is a trend in networking towards a pure layer 3 switch environment. So when switches were first used in the networks, none of them support or supported routing. Now, almost all switches supporting routing. It is likely that soon all switches will incorporate a route processor because the cost of doing so is decreasing relative to other constraints. Okay? Now we have here the business considerations for switch selection. Okay? So, as network administrator, what are the considerations that we should look up? or should look at when purchasing a switch. So the following list highlights the common business considerations when selecting switch equipment. So number one, of course, is the cost. All right. So the cost of the switch will depend on the number on speed of the interfaces, supported features, and expansion capability. Okay. So if you have the budget, go ahead. All right. So if you have the constraint, well, you have to wisely choose a replacement to it. Okay. So another is port density. So we also have discussed port density. Network switches must support the appropriate number of devices in the network. That's port density. Power. Okay. It is now common to power access points, IP phones, okay, and even compact switches using the PoE. So in addition to PoE considerations, some chassis-based switches support redundant power supplies okay reliability the switch should provide continuous access to the network port speed the speed of the network connection is of primary concern to end users frame buffers the ability of the switch to store frames is an important in a network where there might be congested ports to servers or other areas of the network and the last one is scalability. Okay, the number of users on the network typically grows over time. So therefore, 
the switch should provide the opportunity for growth okay so we're done with the switch so the next thing is router hardware so switches are not the only component of a network that come with a variety of features so your choice of router is another very important decision so routers play a critical role in networking by connecting homes and businesses to the internet okay interconnecting multiple sites within the enterprise and providing redundant paths okay and also connecting isps to the internet so routers can also act as a translator between different media types and protocols for example a router can accept packets from an ethernet network and encapsulate them to transport over the serial network okay now this section will help us choose the right router for the organization so the objective of this section is to describe the types of routers available for small to medium-sized business networks now let's talk about router requirements routers use network portion or prefix of the destination ip address to route packets to the proper destination they select an alternate path if the link goes down all host on a local network specify the IP address of the local router interface in their IP configuration. So this router interface is the default gateway. The ability to route efficiently and recover from network link failures is critical to delivering packets to their destination. So routers also serve other beneficial functions like they provide broadcast containment by limiting broadcast to the local network. They interconnect geographically separated locations. The group users locally or logically by application or departments within a company who have command needs to require access to the same resources. They provide enhanced security by filtering unwanted traffic through access control lists. Okay. Now, as the network grows, it is important to select the proper routers to meet its requirements so there are different categories of routers depending on the brand okay so but you could classify it based on the branch routers network edge routers service provider routers or industrial routers okay so branch routers maximizing service availability at the branch requires network design for 24 by 7 by 365 up Okay, so highly available branch networks must ensure fast recovery from typical uh, faults while minimizing or eliminating the impact on service and provide simple network configuration and management. The network edge routers enable the network edge to deliver high performance, highly secure and reliable services that unite campus, data centers, and branch networks. So customers expect high quality media experience and more types of content than ever before. So customers want interactivity, personalization, mobility, and control for all the content. So customers also want to access content anytime and any place they choose over any device, whether at home or at work. Or on the go so network edge routers must deliver enhanced quality of service and non-stop video and mobile capabilities next is service provider routers okay so the service provider routers differentiate the service portfolio and increase revenues by delivering an end-to-end -end scalable solutions and subscribers aware services so operators must optimize operations, reduce expenses, and improve scalability and flexibility to deliver next-generation internet experiences across all devices and locations. So these systems are designed to simplify and enhance the operation and deployment of a service delivery networks. Right, and the last one is industrial routers. 
okay? So industrial routers, such as one shown in the figure here, are designed to provide an enterprise class features in a racket and harsh environments, okay? So their compact, modular, raggedized design is excellent for mission-critical applications, okay? Another consideration for router is the form factors. So this is a small branch office router. It combines one switching, security, and advanced connectivity options in a compact, fanless platform for small and medium-sized businesses. So like switches, routers also come in many form factors. So network administrators in an enterprise environment should be able to support a variety of routers from or from a small desktop router to a rack mounted or blade model. Okay. So routers can also be categorized as fixed configuration or modular like switches. So these routers provides density and resiliency with programmability for a scalable network edge. Okay. Next, these routers are designed to efficiently scale between large data centers and large enterprise networks, web and service providers, one and aggregation network. So with a fixed configuration, the desired router interfaces are built in. Okay. Now this router here is compact and designed for harsh environments. So this is an industrial router. So modular routers come with multiple slots that allow a network administrator to change the interfaces on the router. So routers come with a variety of different interfaces such as fast ethernet, giga ethernet, serial, or even fiber optic. So we have already reached the end of this presentation. So see you on the next video. Have a great day.